Hey there, Jim Johnson for Accent Help here, and I want to talk about the R sounds, the symbols for those, and the names for those. This is a follow-up on a question that somebody had for me, following up on my previous video about various R symbols and the sounds that they make. And this person was asking specifically about the names of those, and there's a text that I am basing this on, this phonetic symbol guide by Pullum and Ladesaw. I am guessing at those names. My apologies if I'm mispronouncing them. But this will go into depth about the different symbols and their names, uh, what they're trying to represent. Primarily, I find it useful about the symbols and their names and then a few technicalities around those. You can't really express in written materials what the sounds actually are, which is why you need to listen to them. So, first of all, the, the first big symbol to be aware of is simply this lowercase r. So this lowercase r that looks like exactly what you would expect from the name of it, there's a couple of different ways that it tends to be used, whether we're talking about more of a broad transcription or a narrow transcription. Usually when you're doing something the broad sense of it, you would put these slanted lines on either side. So these are the very same things that you would type if you were typing out uh, uh, HTTPS, you were typing out a, a web address. So those slanted lines like that, those mean that basically it is the R sound, however specific you want to get beyond that. If you put brackets around it that are these square brackets, those square brackets, even when I write them sloppily as I just did, those square brackets mean more precisely I'm talking about exactly this R. So this lowercase r with the brackets around it, the square brackets, this would be rrr. This would be that trill that happens front of the tongue up near the gum ridge, the alveolar ridge. So this would be what that represents, whereas the other one represents rrr or 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 a variety of things. So it's basically, if you put the slanted lines, you're saying the R sound. Whereas if you put the brackets, which is what I'm going to be focused on here, you put the brackets, then you mean, oh, specifically this kind of quote-unquote R sound. I almost hate to call some of these R sounds because it can make people feel like it is an R. And they might start to think that they're all something like R or whatever R is most familiar to them. Whereas the symbols are trying to represent variations of the R concept. So it's maybe useful to almost take the word R out of it. But for the moment, I'm going to keep it there. And that tends to be the way that it's spoken of. Now, if we simply turned the turned R or you might think of it a longer name, the turned lowercase r, this is the one that many people might think of as the r sound. This would be... This would be a difference between the upright r, that lowercase r, and... Now, why do they write it this way and not this way? Somebody made a decision at some point. And I will also say that... You know, it may not all, all the symbols may not match what your preferences are. This one is a pain in the booty, but it's what's used and that's what we're going with. I have seen texts where they've messed with that, like the old Jerry Blunt uh, accent materials. Well, he would use this lowercase r to represent the r, but then when he was going to talk about something like Scottish, rrr, when he wanted to express that, he then would start to use another symbol, and then it just it really kind of rolls down the road and causes other problems. One of those symbols I'll mention in just a moment. Another one I want to mention right now is another R sound that is very common for many speakers. This is the schwa, which is the turned lowercase e, and then the schwa with this sort of wing ding off of it. It's the roticity diacritic. So roticity basically means the essence of Arnus. So when you take the uh, the schwa, uh, and add the R quality to it, there's a bit of a tongue bunching. You'll probably feel the back of your tongue go up to create this. Uh, uh, uh. That would be what is usually, for many speakers, a post-vowel R. So a pre-vowel R, this turned R, the turned lowercase R, 
And then the schwa roticity, the post-vowel R for many speakers, er. And then you start to get into some other variations like the turned epsilon, which looks like a three. It looks like a number three, the turned epsilon. So an epsilon goes that direction. And then the turned epsilon goes the other way. So the turned epsilon looks very much like a, the number three with the roticity diacritic on it, which means er. Now listen again, the schwa roticity, er, the turned epsilon roticity, er. Is there a difference? It's hard for me to say. Traditionally, the ways that these are used is schwa roticity is the unstressed form of it, and the turned epsilon roticity is the stressed form. So many people would utilize that in the word nurse as opposed to schwa roticity, the unstressed syllable in letter, er, er, er. Those are a couple of words that J.C. Wells uses as lexical set words. So is there a difference? If you look at the vowel chart, these are right next to each other. They are so close to each other. And keeping in mind that your mouth is a heck of a lot smaller than any version of this chart that you'd be able to read. So therefore... Nah, I don't know that there really is a difference to it, but there is certainly is a tradition of how they're used. And I'm going to stick to that tradition because it will tend to match more texts than other things. Now, outside of this, we start to get to slightly more strange R's. So one that I'm going to add to this is I'm going to just do this turned R again. So it's that turned lowercase r. And I'm going to put this wavy line through the middle of it. And that wavy line is a tilde symbol on a keyboard, and when it's in the middle of a letter like that, that tilde represents velarized or pharyngealized. So it's going up towards the velum, the soft palate, or back towards the throat, pharyngealized, your pharynx. So that is one way of expressing what a lot of people will call a bunched R, R, or a hard R, R, R. You might think of it as uh, stereotypical of Southern accents. Rrr, rare, in which case the post-vowel R tends to be the turned R. Whereas in my speech right now, rare, I would say that what I said was a turned R, turned lowercase r, followed by the schwa roticity with another vowel symbol in between, because I will say the schwa roticity is commonly used to express the R that is post-vowel. So in words like near, square, that is the symbol that's usually used with the small cap I for near, for some speakers, the epsilon for, uh, for uh, square, <laughs> or other things that, that fit that, like start the being a lowercase a, a lowercase script a, a script a, basically. Okay, <clears throat> one other version of the hard R that sometimes people use is another turned R like that, but then I'm going to descend a little bit below the line, and it's the right hook R. So it's another turned R, and then it's got a right hook where that, that part that drops down actually curves off to the right. And this is the retroflexed R, which tends to mean the tip of the tongue moves back, but it could just mean that it moves back overall. Typically, it's associated with the tip moving back more. So this might be another way of expressing the hard R sound. Great. So that's another possibility for that. But I think the one with the tilde in it is probably more accurate for that uh, pulled back R, for that bunched R, for that hard R that many speakers use. Well, then a couple of other symbols that are R-like that I think are useful to be aware of. One of them happens in many people's speech, and it really looks like a, um, it looks like a lowercase r, but it's missing the upright arm on it. And right at the moment, I am losing the name of this one. It is, it is, basically that lowercase r once again. There we go. This is a wonderful opportunity for me to show you in the book what it's called. So this, this is not the right hook r. Oh, eventually I'm going to find this. So this r that I'm talking about is the one that is commonly thought of as the tap or flap r. 
and this fish hook R, that's what it is. So in the book, you can see fish hook R, and then it goes into some other details below that about how it's been used. So they give an example as in the Spanish word pero, meaning but, however, right? Pero, it's a single tap, or it's sometimes described as, as a flat, flap. So I, in general, in talking about this one, I want to, I have shifted the way that I speak about it more, and I try to avoid calling it the tapped R as much as I call it the tap or flap. To disassociate it from the R, because for many people, they experience it more as a T or a D between two vowels. Betty bought, her, bought some butter, or leader and leader. I have a leader of this that I got from the leader of the group, where it sounds like a D-like sound. Okay, so that is that curve off to the right there. Now, the next one I want to use is the small capital R, or the small cap R. And this one represents, we had that, that lowercase r, which represented the trill at the, at the gum ridge. Then we get into this one that happens, that's called a uvular trill, the it looks like a capital R, but it's down the same size as the lowercase ones. So that would be... You might think of French or German as some examples of this. You'll have it happen in a number of languages. Now, oftentimes I will say many speakers of those languages, when they're speaking English, they start to do this one, which is the turned small cap R. That's one of the names that's given it to it. I believe it's also sometimes called the flipped small cap R or small capital R. So again, it's a small version of a capital R, but this one's just been turned upside down, basically. So it's been flipped upside down. So this one is a fricative, so there's friction to it, instead of actually meeting up in a trill. So instead of it is and I find that many speakers actually do this when their home language has this one that is the uvular trill. They will actually do this more uvular fricative instead. So these are the R symbols that I tend to make use of when I am trying to describe accents and differences in accents. If you want to dive into other accents, or you want to dive into some studies of phonetics, you can look at the materials on my website, AccentHelp.com. Thanks.